Dr. Leonard Sachs, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, so you have spent your career researching and investigating how sex differences between boys and girls can affect their intellectual and emotional development and have been an advocate to do make policy changes to take those the new research about sex differences into account. And in fact, one of your books is called Why Gender Matters. And a popular idea out there is that, you know, gender really doesn't matter that much. Yes, there, there could be some differences, but any differences that exist are negligible. Why does gender matter in the intellectual and emotional development of our children? Well, you certainly have described the political consensus, which is that gender doesn't matter, that gender is a social construct, and that anyone who says otherwise is either an idiot, a Republican, or both. Uh, but that's actually not the reality, and it's not what the data show. Uh, for example, give a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons to a child, four, five, six years of age. I cite studies in which researchers gave, did exactly that uh, in the United States, another study in England, another in South Africa, another in Japan, another in Thailand, in each study, researchers gave young children a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons and asked them to draw whatever they want. Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees. Usually two, three, or four standing on a horizontal ground. The people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The girls use 10 or more crayons with a predominance of red, orange, yellow, green, beige, and brown. Most boys, not all, but most boys do something quite different. Most boys are trying to draw a scene of action at a moment of dynamic change, like a monster eating an alien or a rocket smashing smashing into a planet. Human figures, if present, are often stick figures, lacking eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The boys use six or fewer crayons with the predominance of black, gray, silver, and blue. I have personally been in the classroom when the teacher has given a piece of paper and a box of crayons to all the girls and boys in her classroom. And she is praising and commending Emily and Melissa and Sonia and Vanessa for their pictures, uh, people, pets, flowers, and trees. But then she comes to Jacob's picture. And Jacob's trying to draw a car crash at the moment of impact where one car is being crushed between two others. And she says, no, Jacob, you know, a car crash. That's so violent, you know, and uh, people are going to get hurt or injured. And, Jacob, I actually don't see any people at all in your drawing. I can only see cars. Now, look at what Emily drew. And Emily had drawn a picture of a girl with a little puppy and another girl playing with a puppy. You know, why can't you draw something more like Emily? There's one thing that kids are equally good at, girls and boys, at every age, and that's figuring out what the grown-ups like. And it doesn't take the boys very long to figure out they're doing it wrong. I have visited now more than 380 schools across the United States and around the world. And I was in a second grade classroom in the United States where teachers had free time, you can do whatever you want. And some of the girls were sitting and coloring. And one of the boys was running around the room making a buzzing noise. And I stopped him. And I said, how come you don't want to sit and draw? And he said, without hesitation, he said, drawings for girls. Drawing is for girls. Where'd where'd he get that notion? I'm sure the teacher never said drawing is for girls, but she might as well have. She's unintentionally sending the message that drawing is for girls. The lack of awareness of gender differences has the unintended consequence of reinforcing gender stereotypes. And when you look at who's taking AP art history in the United States at high school, you find that girls greatly outnumber boys, which is ironic, because most of the artists they're studying are men, but it works both ways. Ignoring gender differences, pretending that gender doesn't matter, disadvantages girls as well. In 1987, 66% of high school students taking AP computer science were boys, 34% were girls. Last year, only 19% of high school students taking AP computer science were girls. We've gone from 34% in 1987 dropped to 19%. Ignoring gender does not eliminate gender stereotypes. It reinforces gender stereotypes. You end up with what we have in this country, 
which is girls who think computer science is for boys and boys who think drawing is for girls. If you do it differently, then you can break down the gender stereotypes. And I can tell you about a superintendent of 17 elementary schools who insisted that all her teachers learn these strategies. And she told us at the conference I hosted in Houston that at each of those 17 elementary schools, when you say to students, free time, you can do whatever you want, the boys' favorite activity now is drawing. Boys love to draw. Girls love to draw. I don't think there's any innate difference in how much kids love to draw. But there's a big difference in what boys want to draw compared to what girls want to draw. And if you don't understand those differences and pretend that they don't exist, you end up reinforcing gender stereotypes, as we have done in this country. Fascinating. So I imagine testosterone is the big cause of the difference of why boys are more action-oriented? Excuse me. Testosterone has nothing to do with the difference. There is no sex difference in testosterone levels among four, five, six, seven years uh, old children. Uh, children at that age make very little testosterone, and there is no sex difference between the amount of testosterone in a five-year-old boy compared with a five-year-old girl. So why, why, why is the difference, though, there? The sex differences are not related to hormones. They are genetically programmed, and they are found across species. Uh, so, for example, the sex differences that I talk about are just as evident in chimpanzees and monkeys as they are in our species, further evidence that these differences are not socially constructed. Fascinating. So you've hit on a little bit about how teachers may inadvertently give the message to boys that the way they approach learning or what they do is not good. How else have American schools changed in the past 30 years that have put boys at a disadvantage? Indeed. Uh, that's a major focus of my book, Boys Adrift. So I recently visited a high school in this country, in the United States, and uh, parents were telling me about their son, high school English, 10th grade. The assignment was to write a story about anything you like. And this boy wrote to, uh, chose to write a story about the Battle of Stalingrad, winter of 1942, from the perspective of a Russian soldier. And he researched it at, at, at considerable length uh, and described the Russian soldier patrolling a street when he was ambushed by a German soldier. And the Russian soldier fires his rifle at point-blank range into the face of the German soldier and then describes what happens when you fire a uh, military rifle at point-blank range in another man's face. What happens is that the head explodes. And a piece of eyeball goes this way, a piece of chin goes that way, some brain matter goes this way. This boy was suspended from school, and the parents were told he could not return, and so the parents secured at their own expense a professional evaluation and a letter from the professional uh, assuring the school and the district that the boy posed no imminent danger to himself or to others. And when the parents shared that story with me, it really struck a chord because I attended public schools in Ohio, K-12, and in 1977, our lead teacher for English at our high school uh, invited me and three other students to sit for a competition administered by the National Council of Teachers of English. And we were shown into a room, and the proctor gave us each a blue book and said, you have 45 minutes, write a story. I chose to write a story about East German refugees escaping to West Germany. When I, when I share this story with high school students today, I have to explain to them that Germany used to be divided in two, and, and East Germans weren't allowed to, to go to West Germany, which is news to quite a few of them. But anyhow, I imagined East German refugees trying to escape to West Germany, crossing a minefield in the middle of the night. And one of them steps on a mine, which blows off, blows off his left leg to the knee uh, and his right leg to the hip. So he now has no feet. He's crawling west, blood pouring out from the stumps where his legs used to be. The uh, East German guards, of course, have heard the noise and have uh, uh, turned their uh, flood la la lamps to try to uh, find him on the ground and are shooting uh, at him but missing. I described the bullets popping up little clouds of dust around him, and West German guards are calling out encouragement to him. Of course, they, they're not allowed to go out into the minefield, and he's crawling west, and the, the bullets are uh, going on either side of him, and blood pouring out, and finally he reaches the 
the border and the West German guards pick him up to take him to hospital and at that moment he dies. The end. My own mom died in September 2008 and going through her papers after her death, I found that she had kept the certificate sent to our home address by the National Council of Teachers of English awarding me their highest honor in creative writing. <laughs> boys doing things that boys have always done. Writing stories about traumatic amputation, violent death, drawing pictures of soldiers attacking each other with knives, uh, throwing snowballs at each other. Um, used to get you an award, or at least wouldn't get you in trouble. Now you can get expelled or suspended uh, for doing things that boys have always done. That's what I mean when I say that school has become unfriendly to boys. Interesting. So the zero tolerance policies, definitely not boy friendly. Zero tolerance policies for violence, meaning that if you bring a G.I. Joe with a plastic rifle to school, uh, you can be suspended. And I, in my book, I describe several such cases in which elementary school boys were suspended for, for bringing a plastic G.I. Joe sized gun to school. And the principal in each case said, look, it's a zero tolerance policy. That means I have no discretion. The policy says that any replica gun, regardless of size, mandates a 911 phone call and immediate suspension, and that's what I have to do. And the fact that he's five years old and that the gun is so small I have to tape it with scotch tape to the report doesn't matter. That's what zero tolerance means. We now know that zero tolerance policies are not effective. They do not in any way diminish actual school violence. They do substantially increase disciplinary referrals, and I think they do something else that's harder to, me to measure. They send the message to boys that your kind is not welcome here. You like to write stories about combat and World War II. That's not welcome here. And the boys are getting the message loud and clear. We're seeing a disengagement from education among boys uh, in every demographic, white, black, and Latino, affluent, middle-income, and low-income, which is without precedent in this country. And I can tell you stories from my firsthand experience of families where both mom and dad are professionals, uh, read in their spare time, their daughters read in their spare time, and the son told me he'd rather be boiled in oil than read a book in his spare time, uh, because his favorite free time activity is playing Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Halo. Wow. Um... How are some of the ways that boys and girls learn different? I think you mentioned in your book that competition uh, is important for boys. Well, again, the big differences between girls and boys are not cognitive but motivational. The big differences between girls and boys are not in what they can do, but in what they want to do. And that's really the key to understanding all the strategies which I've observed. And again, I didn't make up any of these strategies. They're all strategies I've observed in schools that are successful. Uh, so when you visit a school like Korowa in Melbourne, Australia, where you find that more than half the girls take AP Physics, which is an astonishing figure and unbelievable, but true, you find they teach physics in a profoundly different way. They don't teach it the way it's taught in most of other English-speaking countries. They don't begin with kinematics. They begin, for example, with the wave-particle duality of light. Uh, when you find at schools where all the boys, or the, a great uh, majority of the boys, love to write uh, poetry and love to write uh, stories and love Emily Dickinson and Jane Eyre uh, and uh, uh, Jane Austen, you find that they teach it differently. Uh, so gender does matter, and uh, you do need to understand and learn from master teachers how to engage boys in creative writing and poetry uh, and how to engage girls in computer science and physics. And when you do that, you will find that you will break down gender stereotypes and you can greatly increase the proportion of boys who want to uh, spend their free time uh, reading Emily Dickinson uh, and girls who want to spend their free time writing computer code. However, it is unforgivable to speak these things in this country. Uh, because in this country, what happens at schools of education is determined not by data, but by politics and ideology. Mm. Do uh, our single-sex classes or schools uh, one solution of many that can help uh, break down those gender stereotypes? 
I used to think so, and actually took a five-year sabbatical for medical practice, in part to encourage uh, public schools to offer that option as a choice for parents who wanted it uh, when teachers have appropriate training. Uh, but I have pretty much given up on that. Uh, the uh, Obama administration appointed an ACLU attorney uh, to govern uh, this domain, and she has decided on her own, without any basis in law or regulation, that such programs should not be allowed in American schools. And uh, so she has uh, embarked on a witch hunt, again, without any justification in law or regulation, uh, to shut these programs down. And it's very difficult uh, with the federal government actively seeking to shut your program down uh, to sustain such a program in the United States. Mm. And I guess it's a shame because I think I've read it not only benefits boys, but also girls because it's one of the problems that girls have in classrooms like physics or computer science is that they have that stereotype in their mind uh, that they're girls, they can't do this. Um, and then you, they see the boys raising their hands and jockeying for, you know, trying to make the answer. So they're less likely to participate. I guess they found in all girls yeah. classrooms. That was it. Yeah, that uh, critique uh, had uh, substantial empirical force 30 years ago. But that notion that uh, girls are intimidated because boys are raising their hand uh, really is disconnected from reality today. Uh, what's more common in American schools today is what I call Hermione Granger syndrome, where the, the girl is waving her hand to, to answer the teacher's question and the boys are sitting on their hands mm -hmm. not speaking. That's much more common. But nevertheless, despite the fact that girls today are not intimidated by boys, look, I have met with students in hundreds of schools across the United States. And, I would, for example, I was in a middle school where they had the regular honor roll, which is basically for kids who show up, and then the, the principal's honor roll, which is for the kids who are doing really well. And there were 22 kids on the principal's honor roll at this particular school in the United States, 19 girls and three boys. And I asked the boys, can you explain to me why the principal's honor roll, which all the kids understood was the, the superior honor roll, why, why does the principal's honor roll have 19 girls and three boys? And many boys answered, and they all said the same thing. Girls are smarter. And they're not joking. American boys now believe that girls are smarter than boys, which is weird for me uh, because I'm a middle-aged man, meaning that I grew up in the United States in an era where when boys outnumbered the girls on the honor roll, when those earning honors at high school graduation from the valedictorian to the winner of honors in English to the editor. I was the editor of our high school newspaper. Uh, that's very rare today uh, to find a boy at a non-selective public school editing the high school newspaper. He might be editing the sports page, but across the United States today, when you look at who's editing the newspaper, the yearbook, uh, the poetry review, the girls greatly outnumber boys. And this has gone on for so long now that when you ask boys, why is this so? They answer, uh, girls are smarter than boys. Mm. So the 1970s analysis that girls are intimidated by boys in the classroom uh, really is not uh, valid today. And yet... Girls remain underrepresented in computer science, physics, electrical engineering, not because they're intimidated by boys, but because teachers have no idea how to teach those subjects to girls. Uh, you have to teach the content differently. It's not about relationships. It's not about making it pink. Uh, again, my book, Girls on the Edge, focuses on how do you teach this content in a way that works for girls? not based on theory or MRI scans, but based on what actually works in the classroom to engage and motivate girls in computer science, physics, and electrical engineering. It's pretty well established now, but seldom used. Because again, the notion, merely stating the uh, proposition that the best way to teach computer science to girls is different from the best way to teach computer science to boys is politically unacceptable even if it is empirically very clear. Again, what is taught in schools of education is not based on data or empirical research. It's based on what is politically correct. Interesting. Um, 
So also in Boys Adrift, you talk about the uptick in ADHD diagnoses. Why is that happening? Why, why are there more and more boys on ADHD medication? Right. And it's really dramatic, too, because uh, in 1979, uh, we have a good paper published in Science Magazine showing that uh, about 1%, 1% of American kids uh, have been diagnosed with ADD. Uh, in 2013, the CDC published data showing that 20% of high school boys in this country have been diagnosed and treated for ADHD, which is astonishing. Uh, a, a, a boy in the United States uh, is about 14 times more likely than a boy in England to be treated for ADD. Um, and I encountered this myself, again, in my own practice. Uh, parents were stationed in England uh, for four years. Dad was a civilian contractor of the United States Air Force. He was working in England for four years. Their son was four when they went over and eight years old when they returned. An average student. Uh, but within weeks of returning to public school in Pennsylvania, uh, Mom told me uh, other parents and teachers were saying, you know, um, your son's you know, not an outstanding student. Yeah, well, why don't you have him evaluated? Maybe, maybe he would benefit from being on medication. It was like it was creepy. It was like everyone was, was on the payroll of the drug companies. This is, these are her words. Uh, why in the United States and not elsewhere? Uh, a kid in the United States, as I said, is much more likely to be on medication for ADD. Uh, a kid in the United States is 40 times more likely to be uh, treated for bipolar disorder, 93 times more likely to be on antipsychotic medications like Risperdal or Zyprexa compared to a kid in Italy. Why? Uh, there's a couple things going on here. Uh, one is the tendency in the United States uh, to regard medication as a first resort rather than a last resort. You know, kids misbehave in all countries, and I have visited schools in Australia, in England, in Canada, in uh, Mexico, in New Zealand, uh, in Scotland, uh, and I can tell you that kids misbehave in all countries. But if a kid in Scotland is, is uh, running around and throwing things, the teacher will say, it's quite enough of that nonsense. I expect you to sit still and be quiet. But in this country, it is very light, which, which is what a teacher in this country might have said 30 years ago. But today, a teacher in this country will say to parents, you know, uh, your child... Uh, might benefit from evaluation. He might benefit from medication. Have you thought of having him evaluated? And the parents will take him to the doctor. And in this country, the board-certified child psychiatrist will say, well, let's try Adderall and see, and see if it helps, or Vyvanse. Uh, so there's been an explosion in the prescribing of medication. Uh, and I explore the reasons uh, in my book, Boys Adrift, and in my forthcoming book, The Collapse of Parenting, which was initially titled The Collapse of American Parenting, uh, why most kids we bet would be better off raised outside the United States, but uh, non-celebrity authors don't get to choose their titles, uh, <laughs> and so that title was changed. The title of the book coming out in December is The Collapse of Parenting, uh, The Three Things You Must Do in Order for Your Child to Become a Fulfilled Adult. I, are there any detrimental effects of prescribing ADD medication to children who might not need it? Yes. Uh, well, there's de detrimental effects regardless of whether the child needs it or not. Okay. And I'm talking now about the stimulant medications, Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, Focalin, Daytrona, and the most popular one, Vivance. Sounds like a bunch of different medications, but it's actually just two, amphetamine and methylphenidate. Adderall and Vivance, the most popular medications, are amphetamines. They're speed. And these medications damage the motivational center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. And I have 14 good studies, uh, uh, which I cite, uh, showing that these medications, even in low doses, uh, can damage the motivational center of the brain. And again, I describe uh, such a boy in my own practice, um, rolls out of bed late every day, uh, Mom got frustrated uh, with him one day and confronted him and says, you know, what's the story here? You, you, you wake up late every day, you work a few hours a week at the coffee shop, you're 27 years old. You don't have a life. You don't even have a girlfriend, for goodness sake. And, she, and he laughed. He said, well, I used to have a girlfriend. Uh, 
Then she found out I only work a few hours a week at Starbucks. She dumped me. <laughs> uh, he's fine. Mom is pulling her hair out. Uh, she insisted he come talk to me. He's fine with that. He's known me since he was a kid. He was on Ritalin from nine years of age to 17 years of age prescribed by a different doctor. That's the end result. When you damage the motivational center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, you get a boy who looks fine, feels fine, perfectly content. He's got no drive. He's got no drive. He's perfectly content with his 55-inch flat screen, his online pornography, and his video games. Hmm. I mean, so what should parents do when teachers or counselors or other parents say, hey, maybe you should go get your, your son checked out? Because, I mean, that's a lot of social pressure. Yes, it is. Uh, I absolutely agree. And a parent in the, United, in the United States is under a lot of pressure. If your child is not performing at a high level, uh, you will start to hear those whispers as this parent who returned from England described them. Uh, from other parents say you should have your son evaluated. Uh, and I really fought with the publisher to include uh, formal guidelines in my book, Boys Adrift, so that parents can decide on their own, does my child meet criteria for ADD? And the publisher really challenged me and said, are you suggesting, that, these are the exact words of the publisher to me uh, when uh, Boys Adrift was in production, are you suggesting, the publisher said, that a parent, after reading your book, is competent to question the judgment of a board-certified psychiatrist? And I said, yes. I said, not only that, I'm saying a parent must question the judgment of a board-certified psychiatrist because psychiatrists in the United States prescribe medication for just about every kid who walks in the door. So the moment you make that appointment, it is very likely that the doctor will hand you a prescription at the end of the appointment. And you must be the advocate for your child. And you must question the doctor's diagnosis and the doctor's uh, treatment. Because again, in this country, medication is the first resort. Outside of North America, medication is the last resort. And the result is that we are experimenting on kids in a way which has no precedent. And, uh, you know, I was doing this talk at Grace Church School in Manhattan, and a father stood up and, and challenged me. He said, Dr. Sachs, he said, I just don't find this believable. He said, millions of kids are taking these medications, and you're suggesting that these medications damage the motivational center of the brain. I'm sorry, Dr. Sachs, I just can't buy that. If there was any truth to what you're saying, and I interrupted him, I said, if there was any truth to what I'm saying, you'd have heard this before from a more authoritative source than Leonard Sachs, a family doctor. You'd have heard this from someone like Dr. Joseph Biederman, a chief of research in pediatric psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And of course, Dad didn't know where I was going with this. And I said, you know, the same thought occurred to Senator Charles Grassley, United States Senate Judiciary Committee, who summoned Dr. Biederman to the United States Senate and said, Dr. Biederman, you've really been pushing Adderall hard. You have said that if a parent, uh, if a doctor prescribes Adderall for a child and the parent does not promptly fill and administer that medication, Dr. Biederman, you've said that parent should be considered for charges of criminal child neglect. Uh, Dr. Biederman, are you by any chance taking money from the drug companies that you've never publicly disclosed? But it turns out he was, uh, more than $1.6 million, according to his count. That count was never independently verified, um, which is fine. He didn't break any law. Uh, a doctor can accept as much money as he wants to from the drug companies, and he's not breaking any law in the United States. But his action was unethical. He should have told us that he was taking this money, that he was functioning essentially as a paid spokesperson for the drug companies. Uh, but he's still a director of pediatric psychiatry research at Harvard, despite all the articles in the New York Times uh, documenting how he took all this money. And it's not just Dr. Biederman. Uh, the... Uh, Dr. Uh, Senator Grassley, in his investigation, had many of the leading lights of uh, American psychiatry come in. And, and the most chilling line of testimony, he asked one of these psychiatrists who had accepted millions of dollars and not disclosed it, why didn't you disclose it? And the, the psychiatrist said, well, because it's standard practice. Mm. It's 
standard practice. Those were his exact words. And uh, that's very troubling. Uh, when the leaders of child psychiatry say that it's standard practice for the leaders of child psychiatry to accept millions of dollars from drug companies and not to tell us about it, uh, that's really troubling. Now, your local child psychiatrist isn't getting anything, I assure you. And I've given these talks to psychiatrists, and they are incensed that their leaders have sold out, uh, that the leaders of child psychiatry in the United States at Harvard, at Emory, at the National Institute of Mental Health, have accepted millions from the drug companies, never disclosed it, and made these pronouncements without telling us that they were functioning as paid spokesmen, and they were all men, uh, paid spokesmen for the drug companies. Wow, that's incredible. You um, don't have that anywhere outside of North America. Yeah, so it's unique to the United States. Um, so one factor that you talked about in Boys Adrift that I didn't really know much about until I read about it, that's starting, we're seeing how it's affecting boys, and I think there's even research saying it's affecting girls as well, uh, is this, I, this endocrine uh, disruptors? Endocrine disruptors. Endocrine re- disruptors. What are those, and how do they affect the physical, mental, and emotional health of boys and girls? And girls, absolutely. Uh, so that's a focus not only of my book, Boys Adrift, but also of my book, Girls on the Edge. Uh, so uh, when I give this talk to parents, I'll look around for someone who has a clear plastic water bottle, and I'll hold it up. And I'll say, this bottle is made out of polyethylene terephthalate, and it was probably shipped in a truck. Uh, And inside a truck, the temperature can get very warm. Inside a uh, a closed truck on a sunny day, even if the ambient temperature is not warm, the temperature in the truck can easily rise to 120, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And when that happens, toxins such as diethylhexyl phthalate and antimony will leak out of the plastic and into the water. They're odorless, they're tasteless, but they work in your body like a female hormone like estrogen. Um, and the irony is that these people think they're really healthy by eating, drinking bottled water, and of course they're consuming these endocrine disruptors, substances that work in the human body the way that female hormones do. And the effects are different on boys compared with girls. Uh, in boys, in teenage boys, you drop testosterone levels. And teenage boys need testosterone for motivation, among other things, and I, and I document and explain that point in Boys Adrift. Um, but the, the effect in girls is to accelerate the onset of puberty. And so in the United States, more than half of girls have now begun the process of puberty before 10 years of age. Uh, puberty accelerated for both boys and girls throughout much of the 20th century, but in the last 30 years, the age of onset of puberty has not changed uh, for boys, it's stayed around 12 years of age, but it has accelerated, uh, continued to accelerate really without pause in girls, so that, as I said, more than half of American girls have now begun puberty prior to 10 years of age. Uh, and that's really harmful for lots of reasons, uh, for girls and for boys. Um, I was sitting in a uh, uh, seventh grade classroom uh, where there was a 13-year-old boy sitting next to a 13-year-old girl The 13-year-old girl could easily have passed for a 16-year-old girl. The process of puberty was complete. Uh, The 13-year-old boy could easily have passed for a 9-year-old boy. The process of puberty had not yet begun. There's always been a uh, sex difference in the age of onset of puberty, uh, but 30 years ago it was a matter of months, now it's a matter of years. Uh, But again, talking about boys, you look at men at university in the United States, and according to recent studies, one in three college-age men now report difficulty achieving and maintaining an erection. Um, a college-age man uh, today has a testosterone level uh, comparable to what would have been seen in a 50-year-old man uh, two generations back. Uh, so this has big consequences. Uh, and uh, one of cor- which is the uh, decline of courtship Uh, And you find quite a few men, and I've spoken to them personally, uh, who would rather masturbate over pornography rather than uh, pursue and date and be intimate with a young woman. That is now common in the United States. It would have been considered pathological uh, as recently as 20 years ago. Fascinating. So what can uh, people or parents do to avoid or mitigate the effects of um, these disruptors? Yeah, it's actually 
very easy to protect your child from endocrine disruptors. Uh, don't ever cook anything in plastic. Don't buy anything that's shipped room temperature in plastic. Uh, it's fine to buy a juice in plastic if it was shipped refrigerated and it's stored refrigerated in the grocery store. Uh, but plastic is a source of many of these endocrine disruptors. Uh, cosmetics, likewise. Uh, uh, many of the shampoos and lotions that uh, children, especially girls, use are very high in these endocrine dis disruptors. Manufacturers in the United States are not required to disclose that. But again, I provide very detailed guidelines in uh, my book, Girls on the Edge, and also for boys and Boys Adrift. Fascinating. I know a lot of our listeners are, they're the parents of sons. They're also the parents of daughters. You, you mentioned one of the challenges facing girls is uh, the way that we teach, for example, physics or computer science just isn't what motivates them or gets them interested. What are, other some, what are some other challenges facing young girls in America today? Well, I think the sexualization of, of girlhood is a big one. That's the opening chapter of my book, Girls on the Edge. Um, and I begin the book uh, with Halloween, uh, with, again, a family from my own medical practice, where mom was trying to persuade her daughter to wear the uh, Bavarian Durndal outfit that she had worn for Halloween when, when she was 10 years old. And the girl said, no, you know, I've already uh, picked up my outfit. This was a few years back. Uh, she had chosen a Pussycat Dolls outfit, uh, which consisted of a brassiere top, hot pants, uh, fishnet lingerie and stiletto heels, uh, which they had bought, which was on sale at Walmart. Uh, you know, if you imagine walking into Sears 30 years ago saying, hey, I'd like to buy an outfit for my nine year old girl that consists of a brassiere top, uh, hot pants, uh, fishnet lingerie, and uh, stiletto heels, they'd probably call the police. You know, they'd probably arrest you because <laughs> you're obviously a pedophile. Uh, but today, this is sold at Walmart and and uh, all the other major outlet outlets, and here's what's scary, it's what all the cool nine-year-old girls are wearing. And when mom said, well, you know, if you don't want to dress up in my outfit, look, there's a bunch of grapes, you could dress up like a bunch of grapes. And her daughter said, mom, only the fat girls dress like that. Um, the cool girls, uh, going back now to my own words, the cool girls all dress in this uh, provocative um, uh, and revealing uh, stuff. That's what you wear if you're a cool girl and you're nine years old in the United States. And this is really harmful because presenting yourself as a sexual object when you're a nine or 10 year old girl before you have a sexual agenda, we now have good research on this. It dislocates your sexual frame of reference. Um, sex become, uh, sexual, sexuality becomes a performance, a show that you put on for boys. And one consequence of this is an explosion in the proportion of girls who identify as lesbian or bisexual. Fifty years ago, the best numbers were that between one and two percent of American women, women identified as lesbian or bisexual. Uh, right now, depending on which study you look at, between 15 and 24 percent of young uh, women and teenage girls identify as lesbian or bisexual. So that's a factor of 10 increase, a tenfold increase. Uh, in 50 years. When you look at men, what proportion of men identify as gay or bisexual hasn't changed in 50 years. It stayed rock solid at 3 to 4%. Uh, so why is that? Why has this exploded for girls and really not changed at all for boys? Well, that's, again, the focus of the opening chapters of Girls on the Edge. But one reason is the, the sexualization of girlhood, the way in which... Uh, the society, the culture, the popular culture, including the Disney Channel, now pushes girls to present themselves sexually at eight, nine years of age in a way that would have been unthinkable and considered perverse uh, a generation ago. Uh, middle school has, has trickled down into third grade, and I've had eight-year-old girls uh, uh, whose mom have told me that she's refusing to go to school because the, the boys say she has a, a muffin top. Uh, meaning that you have to wear midriff uh, to be a cool girl at eight years of age, and she has a little roll of baby fat over her butt, uh, her, uh, her belt line, and that's what uh, the kids call a muffin top, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an insult. Um, and so she doesn't want to go to school. She is 
judging herself based on whether or not the boys think she's cute at eight years of age. And that's really harmful. Yeah, and I'm sure that leads to further problems of body dysmorphia, anorexia, bulimia later yep. on. Yep. Well, Dr. Sachs, this has been a, a really fascinating discussion, and we didn't get to everything we could we could talk about because there's so much. Um, but where can people learn more about you and your work? Well, thank you. Uh, I just hired a professional web designer to bring my website into the 21st century. It's LarenSachs.com, where you can see all the uh, presentations I'm doing and uh, uh, send me an email, and I do try to answer everyone if I possibly can. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again. Our guest today was Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's the author of the book, Why Gender Matters, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge. You can find those all on Amazon.com. Go pick them up if you want. And also, you can find out more information about his work at LeonardSachs.com. And that's L-E-O-N-A-R-D-S-A-X.com.